Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to the third chapter of Daniel. Now at this time, Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon, and he was the greatest of all the kings probably that ever lived. And he conquered Jerusalem, and he takes some Jewish captives among the young men, many of them in their middle or late teens. They were scientifically inclined. He takes them back to Babylon to train them to help him as he builds his empire. Very much like the Soviets and the Americans after World War II, they took German scientists. I remember one of them was Werner von Braun, who made a great contribution to the American military power. And I remember sitting with uh, Werner von Braun not long before he died. We were at a banquet in Los Angeles at the Century Plaza Hotel. And my wife and I happened to be at the table with him and we'd known him quite a long time. And he told us how intellectually he had come to believe in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, not just by faith alone, but he became convinced that there was a God and that drove him to study the Bible and the New Testament and he came to know Christ as his Savior. Now among the captives of Nebuchadnezzar, there were a number of top young Jewish men. Four of them are named in this passage, Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And they were disciplined in all the ways of the Babylonians so that they could help as Nebuchadnezzar extended his empire to become the greatest empire in the world at that time. Now Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego knew assertive discipline early. Because as we've already heard in the scripture that was read to us by John Wesley White, they refused to eat of the king's meat and drink of the king's wine because the king's meat had been offered to idols and they knew it was against the law of their God. Now they were 1,500 miles from home. Who would know? Who would care? But they knew God was watching. And as young men, they dedicated themselves and they committed themselves totally to God. Now Daniel had had a dream and uh, he called in the astrologers and the soothsayers and the scientists and all the other people. And he said, tell me what the dream is. Nebuchadnezzar had the dream. And they said, well, tell us the dream. He said, I can't tell you the dream. I can't remember it, but it troubles me. Tell it to me. If you don't tell it to me, he said, I'm going to have you hacked to pieces. Well, boy, that really made them study and work and try to come up with the answer. But they said, we can't tell it to you unless you tell us the dream. We can't interpret it. And so Daniel called one of the guards over to him and he said, I can interpret the dream. God has revealed it to me. My God has. And he went to see Nebuchadnezzar. And he said, don't kill all the astrologers and the soothsayers and the wise men of Babylon. I'll tell you the dream and I'll interpret it. He said, what you dreamed was the dream of a great statue. And it had a gold head and its breast and its arms were made of silver and its thighs and stomach were made of brass. It had legs of iron and it had feet of clay mixed with iron or iron mixed with clay. And Nebuchadnezzar said, that's right, God has revealed it to you. Now, what is the interpretation? And so Daniel interpreted and said, you, sir, are the head of gold. You are the greatest empire, the greatest king that will ever live. And then it will decrease on down till the end of history. And then will come the stone cut out without hands and will crush the image and it will come tottering down. In other words, Daniel was being told by God, that all the empires of the world will someday fail and only the kingdom of God is going to survive. And that was that, but that's the second chapter. Now we come to the third chapter. There's another image. Nebuchadnezzar has become very powerful, very egotistical, as men of power often get. And so he decides he'll build a statue to himself, a big image, 99 feet high made of gold, and he calls thousands of his subjects from many of the countries of the Middle East to come on the plain of Dura. And there, he says, I want, when you hear the trumpet sound, and you hear the music play, and you see the flags coming in, and you see the marching of the soldiers, I want all of you to bow down and worship the image. And if you don't, I'm going to throw you into flames of fire and you'll be burned up. You see, force, false religion does not hesitate to use force. The Bible teaches that Satan is the god of this world. He's the prince and power of the air. 
He's the prince of this world. And he uses force to get people to believe strange things. And we're seeing force used by religious groups today all over the world as tensions are mounting on a scale so rapid that we cannot keep up with them. And we've seen even in the past few days things happening that we never dreamed would happen. But they are happening. And it seems that the world is rushing madly toward World War III, and World War III will be Armageddon. The four horsemen of the apocalypse are already riding. I can hear their hoofbeats. And unless we repent and turn to God, they're going to come with all of their war and their destruction and the starvation and the diseases and the death and the hell that they bring with them. He commands that they worship the image. But Christ also was asked, to worship at the image. He was asked to bow down and worship the devil in Matthew 4. But Jesus didn't argue. He didn't debate. He said, it is written. All he did was to use the Word of God. That's the reason it's important to memorize passages in the Bible, because he just used it as a weapon. And he said, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. God had said in the very first commandment of the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Jesus said in Matthew 6, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism at the same time. You have to choose. That's a choice that every person in this room will have to make. It's a choice that every person watching by television will have to make. It is a choice that every one of us has to make between bowing down to the things of this world that are evil and wrong and bowing down before the true and the living God. And the images that Satan calls upon young people to bow down to today, pride, lust, many other things. Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego restrained their desires in situations of temptation. And they said, no, we will not bow down to the image. Now, Nebuchadnezzar could destroy the body, but not the soul. And Jesus warned about those who could destroy the body and the soul. In Matthew 10, he said, and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You have a body, but living inside of you is your soul, your spirit. That's the part of you that will live forever. The part of you that remembers and the part of you that feels, the part of you that's the real you will live forever. And Jesus said, fear the one that can destroy both body and soul. That's the devil. Because hell was created not for you, but for the devil and his angels. And if you persist in bowing to the images of this world and rejecting the true and the living God in your life, then you are going to follow the devil to hell. Now, to disobey God's commands is called spiritual and eternal death. Now, these three Hebrews did not bow down. They stood up. They were the only ones of the thousands that were there from the different languages and the nations and the ethnic backgrounds of the whole world of that day that came to bow before the image of Nebuchadnezzar. They stood stiff like this as ramrod. They wouldn't bow. And of course, it was reported immediately to the emperor. Now, the alternates before them, they could have taken an alternate route. First, they could have bowed and avoid trouble. It would have compromised all that they believed in. They could have rationalized and said, it's our duty to obey the king. And that's our first duty. But they had a higher law. They had the Ten Commandments. They had God. And secondly, they could have said, it's just a matter of form. After all, religion is a matter of the heart. God knows that inwardly we're true to him, even though outwardly we'll bow down to the image. Or they could have stayed indoors that day. That would have been cowardly. They had an opportunity to witness to thousands that day, and they took an opportunity to do it. Jesus said, he that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. The Bible says, if sinners entice thee, consent not 
follow not the multitude to do evil. Then they could have said, we're far from home. God doesn't expect us to live like we did in Jerusalem. Who'll know? Who'll see us? Or they could have said that they were under obligation to the king, and they were. He'd been very good to them. Or they could have refused to bow, which they did. They refused to bow. Choose you this day whom you will serve, says the Scripture. Who are you going to serve? The true and the living God? Or are you going to serve these things that the devil brings in your path? The images that he places for you to bow to, for you to give in to. Decision could not be put off. They had to make a decision then. When the heralds announced it, when the announcement was made, they had to make a decision. Just like some of you will have to make a decision tonight. You can't put it off. He that hardened his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. God says, my spirit will not always strive with man. There comes a point beyond which you can go in which it is very difficult to return. And tonight, for many of you, this is the decision night. It's either yes or no. You say, well, it may be maybe. Some of you will try to straddle the fence and live in both worlds, but God doesn't allow that. Jesus will not compromise with you. He will not make it easier for you. He will not lower his standards. If he had lowered his standards, he wouldn't have gone to the cross. But he went to the cross and he died and he shed his blood for our sins. He rose again from the dead. He's coming back to rule this world someday. The gospel plan is all set. And God says you have to repent. You have to receive him by faith. You have to accept my son into your heart as Lord and Savior and let him rule your life if you're to enter my kingdom. Yes, they refuse to bow to the devil and give in to the devil. What if it does cost you a few pleasures in order to save your soul? Would it not be better to be thrown into the fiery furnace here than to have both body and soul cast into hell forever? And when your trial comes, and it will, if you're a true, born-again Christian, if you're following Christ, you're going to be tried and tempted and shaken as you've never been before. When it comes, act in the light of eternity. Do not judge the situation by the king's threat or by the heat of the burning, fiery furnace, but by the everlasting God and the eternal life which awaits you. Don't let the music of this world fascinate you. Don't let the drum beats cause you to march to the drum beats of this world. March to another drum beat that the world cannot hear, the drum beat from heaven. March by the steps ordered by the Holy Spirit and set by the example of Jesus Christ. And if you want to make that commitment, you that are watching television, you'll see a tele, uh, telephone number there. Pick up your phone and call that number. Somebody is there waiting to talk to you, to help you, to make that commitment and that decision right now. Some of you are feeling the pressures. Some of you are going through trials and tribulations and temptations which are too great for you and you need help. You need prayer. There's someone there that will pray for you. And if you dial and it's busy, call back several times. They'll be there all evening. These brave young men dared the rage of the infuriated tyrant. And because they saw him who is invisible and had respect unto the recompense of the reward, they believed. But the king gave them another chance. Now, after this life is over, the Bible does not promise that you'll have another chance. No place in the Bible do I find where you're going to have a second chance. The moment you die, that's it. But the king gave them another chance. He gave them another opportunity. And they answered, tremendous answer. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, they said, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so that our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, then he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods now worship the golden image which you have set up. They didn't know that God would ever deliver them. They did not cringe and say, we beseech thee, please, Nebuchadnezzar, don't throw us in. Your majesty, don't. Think it over, sir. We can't disobey God, but we don't want to disobey you either. 
And they did not say, let's have a consultation and come to terms. And they went into this terrible furnace, and the men that threw them in were burned up. That's how hot it was. They said to God, thy will be done. And God says, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. It was only after their decision, they made a decision, after they made their decision, it was then that God intervened and delivered. He says, lo, I'm with you always. And when you have troubles and difficulties, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. And then the king looked into the furnace, standing back as far as he could so he wouldn't be burned up. He looked in and he was astonished at what he saw. What did he see? He said, I see four men. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Three men had been thrown in. They should have been nothing but a crisp. They were bound. But he sees four men, and the fourth one is like unto the Son of God. God had either sent his angel there, or it was the Son of God himself that had come. God is with his people in the fiery furnace. He is with his people in times of temptation and trouble and trial. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God, says the Scriptures. They have no hurt. The Lord shall preserve thee. He shall preserve thy soul. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? The way they walked into the fiery furnace, calm, self-possessed, joyful. Christ was with them. God was with them. Their bonds came off. And when the king ordered them taken out, they came walking out straight as a ramrod with their head high. Not even a hair of their head was singed. Their clothes, they'd gone in fully dressed. Their clothes didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. And the king bowed down before them. And he said, your God, is the true and the living God. And he ordered all the wise men and the soothsayers and the Chaldeans thrown into that furnace. And then he ordered that great crowd from all over the world to bow down to the true and the living God. And he destroyed the image that he'd built. And it changed Babylon because three young men dared stand alone, dared to die dared to look death in the face and say, I believe. That's what Jesus Christ did. He stood before the cross. The cross was to be the next day. And that night on Gethsemane, he knelt down with his disciples and he prayed all night. And he sweat drops of blood. And he said, Lord, to his father, my father, not my will, but thine be done. If there's no other way to save the human race, if there's no other way to save Bill and Jim and Susie and Mary down yonder in 1983, I'll go to the cross. They deserve death. They've broken the law. They deserve judgment and they deserve hell. But if you want me to, and if it's your will, I'll go and take their hell and their judgment in their place. So he stepped out the next day. They put a crown of thorns on him. Here he was, the Son of God, with 72,000 angels with drawn swords ready to come and deliver him and sweep this whole planet out of existence. He said, no, I love them. And then he took that cross on his back and staggered after they'd beaten him and his back was bleeding and they'd pulled his beard and his face was bleeding and they led him up Golgotha's mount, and there they put a spike in each hand and a spike through his feet and a spear in his side, and he hung on the cross naked in front of a mass of people shouting, screaming at him, and he stayed there for you and for me. He took it all alone on that cross for you so that you could have everlasting life. He took the furnace of hell for you so that you might be forgiven of your sins 
And when you die, go to heaven and have peace and joy here and now and have Christ with you through the Holy Spirit now, every day. You don't have to live one minute alone. Every problem, every difficulty that you face, He's there. He helps you in deciding who you're going to marry or what your vocation is going to be or what your life is going to be or help you in your studies or help you in your relationships with other people. He's there to help lift your burdens here and now. That's besides the life to come. He gives both life here and now and life to come, and it's all yours if you put your faith and confidence in Him. You say, well, what do I have to do? Three things. First, repent of your sins. How many of you here tonight could tell me what repentance is? You think you really know Christ, don't you? You go to church. You've been baptized. You've been to Sunday school. But you probably don't even know what repentance is. Repentance means change, the change of your mind, the change of your way of living. If when you came to Christ, your life didn't change dramatically over a period of time, then there's something wrong with that decision. If you have a doubt in your heart or mind that you're ready to meet God right now, you better settle it tonight and recommit your life to Christ and say, Lord, I need you. I was the leader of the young people in my church, but I really didn't know Christ in a personal way. And one night I found him. He found me and changed my life completely, and it was a totally different Billy Graham than the one that just went to church and led young people and told the elders of the church that I believed all the catechism and believed all those things. I did believe them with my head, but not my heart. My will had not been surrendered to the will of Christ. And then the second thing is by faith you receive him. The word faith means commitment. We've heard that word tonight, commitment. That means you totally surrender for the rest of your life to Jesus Christ, not only as Savior, but as Lord. You surrender your personal life, your body, your mind, everything to him. And then thirdly, you're willing to obey him and follow him and serve him. Three things, repent, believe, and the word believe is where we stumble because we do believe with our minds, but I'm talking about believing with everything you have, surrendering it all to him, and then obeying him, whatever the cost. The world or the furnace, which will it be? Because there is a judgment to come. And if you'll make that decision tonight, I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat. We've seen several hundred every night do what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of the platform and say by coming symbolically, I do repent of sin. I do receive Christ as best I know how. I will follow him with his help. I'm going to ask you to come and stand here. And after you've come, I'm going to say a word to you, have a prayer with you, and uh, we'll give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. It's a lifetime commitment to Jesus Christ. Quickly, you come. We're going to wait. As you can see, these hundreds responding here, we want you to take time to call that number now on your screen. Counselors are standing by, ready to talk with you. If the line is busy, just wait a few moments and then call again. Counselors will be there as long as the calls keep coming in. You that have been watching by television can see that many people here in Oklahoma City are coming to make their commitment to Christ. You can make that commitment where you are. Pick up the telephone and call the number on your screen. And if you don't reach someone, keep dialing. They'll answer after a while. May God bless you and help you as you make this commitment. And be sure and go to church next Sunday.
time of decision is really the most important part of every crusade service. And it's the most important part of this telecast because right now where you are, you can make your commitment to Jesus Christ. Take time to make that telephone call or to write Billy Graham. And the same helps we are giving these tonight who are responding here, we will send to you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll-free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. We still have a window of opportunity to reach a lost and dying world with the truth of God's love. It's not too late. We've got an opportunity to tell others about Jesus Christ. What are you going to do with it? From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Tonight I want to read a passage of scripture that was on the cake that they presented to my oldest grandson the day that he was confirmed. And this was on the cake. It was third epistle of John, the fourth verse. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. Of course, John was talking about those young converts of his that he called his children. But here we could apply it to our families and to our own children. You know, the other night, a 20-year-old couple got married on Friday night in Ohio. They came to Toronto on their honeymoon, attended the crusade Tuesday night, and responded to the invitation to receive Jesus Christ. And the counselor said the husband immediately started taking his role as the spiritual leader of the home because he said, we're going to get into the Word of God. And the counselor added, what a wedding present that was. There was a man here the other night who is one of the chief karate instructors in South Africa on his way home to Johannesburg. And after taking some refresher classes in Japan, he stopped here for two days. He attended the crusade, accepted Christ as his savior. 41 years old, he said, I'm rushing back to Johannesburg to tell my wife and family that I have found Jesus Christ. And we've had story after story. And if I'd had time tonight, I was going to tell you some more stories of people that have found Christ here in this tremendous crusade here in Toronto during these days. But I want to get quickly to what makes up a happy home or how you can have an, a, the right kind of a home. And the first point that I would like to make is that God performed the first marriage in the Garden of Eden. And it was God's idea to have a family in the first place. Before the cities and governments, written language, before nations, temples, churches, there were families. And the family is the most important institution in the world. The first miracle that Jesus ever performed was at a wedding at Cana of Galilee. And Jesus was underscoring the importance of the home because if the home goes, the nation is going to go. It was my privilege the other day to talk to the Prime Minister of this country and today to the Premier of Ontario. And in, on both occasions, it was interested how we got to this idea of how the home is a basic unit and the home cannot be separated from the health 
of the nation or of the province. Many today are wringing their hands with fear and insecurity. But more important than what happens at Wall Street or what happens at the United Nations is what is happening to our families. In the home, character is formed. Integrity is born. Values we live by are made clear. Goals are set. Attitudes are formed that last a lifetime. Is your home built on a solid foundation? That's the question I want to ask. Remember the man Jesus told about that built his house on a rock? Is your house built on a rock? Is your home secure tonight? Or is it filled with tension? Is it about ready to break up? We've had more couples come forward here that were living together without marriage or more couples come forward here that have been separated and more couples that have been divorced that have come here together and be reunited than almost any crusade we've held in a long time. And it indicates to me that this is a growing problem in Toronto and it's a growing problem in this part of Canada as well as in the United States and other parts of the world. The third point I'd like to make is that our modern life puts tremendous pressures on the home and the family. You know some of the pressures that the home faces today. It reminds me of Nehemiah, the fourth chapter, where the scripture says there is much rubbish so that we're not able to build a wall. And we see rubbish everywhere. Rubbish on television and in films and in magazines. Making fun of the home, making fun of marriage, making light of one of the holiest of all institutions, the marriage. And God has indicated from one end of the word to the other that when the home fails, the society is going to fail. And I tell you this, unless we have a spiritual revival and our homes are renewed, the nation is going to be destroyed. There's no way that we can escape the judgment of God unless we come back to Christian or to God-fearing homes. You know, we're living in cities today. All over the world, people are moving to cities. As a boy on the farm, I could watch my father work and was made part of that work. Today, a man goes to work in a factory on office and his wife goes off to work too. And often the children never see either one of them doing their jobs. And they never become a part of it. In small rural communities of yesterday, everyone knew everyone. Teachers and parents were friends. But the working mother or the two career family is already upon us. And many times it's impossible to escape it because of taxes and because of inflation and all the rest of it. In order to make a living, both parents have to work in many instances. But Ezekiel 16 says, as is the mother, so is her daughter. As is the mother, so is her daughter which indicates that we as parents are to set the example in front of our children of Bible reading, of prayer, of integrity, of truthfulness, of honesty, and let them see in us Jesus Christ. Because one could say, as the father, so the son, as well as the mother and her daughter. And we have that responsibility as Christians. But we're glorifying today not getting married. I read the other day that 1,500,000 couples are living together in the United States without any intention of ever getting married. And the number of those getting married is decreasing and the number of divorces is mounting until one of our so great sociologists said recently at Columbia University that we may not have any homes at all by the end of this century. It may be something of the past. And sex is now treated by many like a physical appetite to be satisfied completely apart from any meaningful relationship. Just like you go out and buy a hamburger to satisfy your appetite. So you go out and have sex. That's not what God meant it to be at all. It's a holy gift from God to be used within matrimony. But there's a satanic attack on the family today. 
Even Christian families are feeling it. I've never heard so many stories of Christian families even having so much tension and so much difficulty. We've never had more books on the bookshelves telling us how to solve our family problems or sexual problems than we have today. And yet somehow we're more miserable, we're more broken, we're more torn, we're more hurt than we've ever been. Why? Because we have not taken the Word of God into account because God has laid down the rules and the regulations for a successful and happy home. And we've broken them. We thought we could do it some other way and we found that we failed. Let's come back to the Bible. Let's come back to the Word of God and build our homes on this book and the God that performed the first marriage. The fourth point I would like to make is that the family is still the most durable institution in the world. Historically, the family has survived all attacks. But many today want love without commitment. The latest polls indicate that young people may be turning back toward the family relationships and commitments, and it's most encouraging. Perhaps the tide is beginning to turn. I pray that it will be. I believe it is beginning to turn in the United States. And I'm happy to see it because, you see, even in Russia and China where they profess atheism, they're finding they cannot build a strong society without a home. They experimented at first without homes. They laughed at marriage, but now they've changed their minds. And then the fifth thing I'd like to say is the family needs help and encouragement. God is interested in your family, your marriage, your children. He shows us the ideals and the goals for the family, and he's willing to help us. Ezra said, then I proclaimed a fast there to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones. Seeking God's will for your family. That's what Ezra was doing, seeking the will of God for his family. Have you sought God's will? Have you gotten on your knees and committed your children to the Lord time after time? Do you gather them together for family devotions? Or are you too embarrassed to? Or too hypocritical to? What keeps you from doing it? Because it's been proven statistically that the homes that have Bible reading and prayer and go to church every Sunday, there's only one divorce in 400 marriages. While the national average in the United States is now almost one out of every two marriages. The answer is God. The answer is spiritual. The answer is surrendering your heart and your life to Jesus Christ as parents, as children, so that every member of the home knows Jesus Christ and loves the Word of God. And then the next point I would like to make is that the husband-wife relationship is the key to the family's success. Nearly all the psychologists or sociologists that I've talked to and books that I've read indicate that the home will only rise so high as the husband-wife relationship. The children seeing love between the husband and the wife. You see, many people get married without any idea of how much is at stake. And laying the foundation for failure in the very beginning, in courtship. You be careful who you go with and fall in love with. Be sure that he or she is God-fearing and loves Christ. The scripture says, be not unequally yoked together. How many of you have tried it and failed? There must be a spiritual oneness. There are three people that make up a marriage, the husband, the wife, and God. And be sure God is in your marriage. You see, so many are marrying someone with whom they have a very little chance of having a successful marriage. 
Seventeen magazine made a survey some time ago of young men and they asked the young men many questions and one of the questions was, what do you want your girlfriend to have on the first date? And the number one answer was a good figure. I would say the number one answer as far as I'm concerned would be to love the Lord with all her heart and all her mind. Many marry without being aware of the ideals and the goals which God has set for marriage. You see, God planned marriage for people with some maturity. Now, you can be mature when you're 17. You can be mature when you're 18, and you can be absolutely immature at 40. I see some little teenage 40-year-olds trotting around. And there are many of them. The Scripture says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother. You must be people who are ready to emotionally leave home. Now you think about that. We're always to love our parents. I don't care where you go to the ends of the earth. You're to love your parents. You're to confer with your parents. You're to honor your parents. You're to enjoy your parents. But when you get married, you must realize that they can never, that you can never again depend on them as you did when you were little children. Many parents ruin the marriage of their children by refusing to turn them loose. Learn when to turn them loose. For this cause shall a man leave, and his wife must be first, the husband must be first, while still honoring and loving and seeking the advice and the counsel of the parents. And the parents must learn how to turn loose. And when you turn them loose, I'm going to tell you something. When you turn them loose, they'll come back to you closer than ever as adults. And you'll enjoy them as much as you ever did. And then God wants marriages to be permanent until death do us part. Many people enter the marriage vow without any idea that this is for keeps. A young man at the marriage altar thinking to himself, if this doesn't work out, I'll get a divorce. Yes, tensions are going to come. There's going to be that adjustment period. And you keep adjusting the rest of your life. There'll be problems. There'll be disagreements. But you're to accept each other's faults. Your wife is not perfect and your husband is not perfect. You found that out after about two days. That first morning you saw her in curlers. And that first morning when she saw, saw you get up bleary-eyed. And it's not always romantic. But we are to be together in a relationship that God has formed. We become one flesh. And many people that have been married for many years have loved each other so much and been together so much and know each other so well that they begin to look like each other. That's actually true. People tell me that I look like Ruth. If that's true, I'm getting mighty good looking. And I'll tell you, when I haven't seen her in two weeks, she looks better than ever. <laughs> but there must be a lifetime commitment when you come to Christ. It's forever. Repeat it to yourself. Forever, forever, forever. Till death do us part. Don't ever entertain the idea of separation and divorce. If you know Christ, He can hold you together. There is no problem that you face that cannot be solved by the Lord Jesus Christ. And then God's ideal is for the husband and the wife to be faithful to each other. Faithful to each other. I read the other day that 70% in a survey, 70% of the men 
it indicated were cheating on their wives. I just can't believe that statistic. I, I cannot allow myself to believe it. It didn't say how many wives cheated on their husbands. But I want to tell you the Bible calls it adultery. And the Bible says that no adulterer will be in heaven. We don't realize what a vile and terrible thing it is to break the marriage vow with that type of a sin. I know it's old-fashioned. I know that's out of date. But that's the teaching of the Word of God, and the Word of God never, 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 never changes. It's the same. God hasn't changed in all these centuries. Do you think that God is changing His whole nature to accommodate Himself to your sins? No. He's the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. I'm the same God that hated the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, hate the sins that we're committing today in the countries of the world that I travel in because it's worldwide. To have an affair is said to put uh, spice in a marriage. I read that the other day in some newspaper. It's a sin against God and it breaks the marriage vow. And many of you are asking, well, what can I do to help my marriage? The first step is to turn your life over to Jesus Christ. Let him come into your life. You say, well, how do I do that? We've seen hundreds and even thousands here in Toronto come to Christ. Be willing to repent of your sins. That's the first step. Realize that God loves you. In spite of your sins, in spite of your failure, He loves you and He's willing to forgive you, but you must be willing to repent. And that word repent means to change. Change your mind. Change the direction of your life and determine that you're going to bring your life under the Lordship of Christ. If you failed in the home, if you failed at being a parent, if you failed at being a husband or a wife or an obedient child in the home, Surrender your life to Christ tonight and let him come into your heart and help you to be the right kind of a husband or wife or the right kind of a child. We had a man come forward in Las Vegas to make his commitment to Christ and he and his wife were in the divorce courts. And he called her on the phone and he said, I'd like to come and see you said, I'd like to settle this divorce business. And she didn't know what he meant. And so they got together and they went to the little restaurant where they'd been before. And they fell in love all over again. They called their lawyers and said, call it off. We're being reunited in Christ. That can happen to you. Maybe you and your wife haven't separated, but spiritually you're separated. Emotionally, you may be separated, psychologically separated. Let Christ come in and bring you together. And then our children need help. Our children need help. They need your love. You know, I heard a psychiatrist say many years ago that helped me. They said, you know, your children may come to a point where they do rebel because most children come to a point where they're seeking their own identity, and, and they may rebel for three or four years or five years, a little bit. Maybe some of them wildly rebel. This psychiatrist said, let them know that you disapprove, but that you love them. And when they come through that point of rebellion, and when they find their own identity, the love will still be there. Let the love of Christ dominate your family, dominate your relationships within the family. And you can have a wonderful home. It's not too late to repair it. It's not too late to change. You can start tonight. What do you have to do? Be willing to repent of your sin and receive Christ by faith into your heart. Notice I said by faith. You may not understand it all. You may not understand what I mean when I say accept Christ by faith. You don't have to understand it all. Come by simple childlike faith, like a little child 
is trusting his Father, you trust the Heavenly Father. Put your hand in his hand tonight and say, tonight, I want Christ. You see, he died on the cross for you. He shed his blood for you. He rose again from the dead, and he's alive, and the Bible says he's coming back again. You believe that and accept that, and that he's willing to come by the Holy Spirit and live in your heart tonight, right now. You don't have to live the Christian life alone. You don't have to be that husband alone or that wife alone or that child alone or that teenager alone. Christ will come into your heart right now tonight if you'll let him. And on this wet, damp, cold evening, what a wonderful moment to let Christ come into your own heart and you become the right kind of a husband, the right kind of a wife, the right kind of a son or daughter. I'm going to ask you to receive him right now. I'm going to ask hundreds of you to get up out of your seat right now and come out here on this feed.